This podcast is brought to you by Audible, the world's leading source of audiobooks. If you would like to support it, go to audibletrial.com forward slash Sam Harris. Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Today I'll be speaking with Joseph Goldstein, who is an old friend and quite a distinguished and wonderful teacher of meditation, in particular Vipassana meditation, mindfulness meditation. Joseph and I spoke before on my podcast about a year ago, and that episode was entitled The Path and the Goal. And if you haven't listened to that, I recommend you do before listening to this one, because this one is, in fact, a response to listener questions that arose from that first podcast. The conversation this time around, because it's in Q&A format, really does not take any kind of linear path from beginner to expert in terms of its content areas. And one thing I'd also point out is that I make no effort to discuss the liabilities of Buddhism as a religion. As most of you know, I don't consider myself a Buddhist. I just find the practice of meditation incredibly useful. Joseph certainly considers himself a Buddhist, and he is a quite well-known Buddhist teacher and largely responsible for bringing the techniques of Buddhist meditation into more prominence in the West over the last 40 years or so. But we use Buddhist terminology, and while we define these terms from time to time, I'm not making any effort in these conversations to divorce this topic from its traditional Buddhist context. I do that more in my book, Waking Up. This is just to say that those of you who may be uncomfortable with seeing uh, meditation and the nature of mind discussed in an explicitly Buddhist framework will... um, continue to be uncomfortable throughout this conversation. But given Joseph's background and his expertise, it would have simply been a waste of time to try to translate our terminology for export out of Buddhism into um, some other non-sectarian context. In any case, Joseph is a gem. He's, as I said the first time around, one of the wisest people I've ever met. And as you'll hear at the end of our conversation, he and our friend Dan Harris, the ABC News anchor and author of the New York Times bestseller, 10% Happier, uh, have designed a short meditation course in the form of an app. And where this podcast is embedded on my blog, I have a link to the relevant page in the iTunes store. And while you can start that course for free, I think you get the first three days free. If you choose to buy the whole course, you get a 20% discount using the product code WAKINGUP, all in caps. So if you want more information about that, please check my blog. And without further preamble, I give you Joseph Goldstein. I'm now with Joseph Goldstein. I have him back for round two of more meditation punishment. Thanks for coming back, Joseph. Thanks for doing this. It's great. (laughs) I think something like 180,000, is that right? People have listened to the first one. That could be the same four people. (laughs) who are just diehards hitting refresh over and over again. But uh, we certainly were more esoteric than many conversations on this topic become. But I, I think that, that was probably a strength. I think a lot of people appreciated us getting into the, the weeds about mindfulness and, and the difference between different types of mindfulness and Dzogchen versus Vipassana. But, or Dzogchen and Vipassana. Yeah, yeah <laughs> as the case may be. So... Um, Let's get into it again, and we have a, a bunch of questions that have come in. But first, is, is there anything that you recall from our last conversation that you wanted to revisit and uh, explore, or you want to retract something that I said? <laughs> anything come to mind? Uh, nothing really is coming to mind. The older I get, the less I recall. The, the less that comes to mind? <laughs> okay, well, we have many questions, and that, maybe that'll just start us off. So uh, Jamie Lunsford asks, what amount of practice is required before the average practitioner can expect to obtain, quote, sufficient concentration, as Joseph puts it, to change the quality of her experience? I'm sure it varies, but more generally, what, what if I never go on a 10-day retreat or meet a Dzogchen master? Uh, can everyday practice still serve me? I think it's correct to say that there is no average meditator. You know, that people bring... Uh a wide variety of backgrounds 
uh, to the meditation. And so for some people, concentration comes quite easily. And for others, it takes quite a systematic training. What I would say is it's really important to watch the commitment to being mindful throughout the day because concentration actually comes about through the continuity of mindfulness. So it's not so much, you know, an effortful focusing, but rather more quality of being relaxed back into the moment mm. to get right back into the Dzogchen Vipassana uh, framework. A Dzogchen phrase that is used very often in, which we might have mentioned in our last talk, the phrase that's used is undistracted non-meditation. So the non-meditation part is, you know, suggests that effortless quality of settling back into a natural awareness. But often people forget the undistracted part. Yeah, yeah. That, that's where it's about this continuity of relaxed awareness. And so really the, the question is whether we're really considering our, our meditation to be the time that we're sitting on a cushion you know, for however long each day, or we're seeing it as practicing that quality of undistracted non-meditation throughout the whole day. Mm. And it's that continuity which will lead to some stability. What, what does the phrase, not, the word non-meditation mean to you? Because uh, undoubtedly that's going to be confusing to some people. I think it has many levels of meaning, but just in the simplest way of understanding it. It can refer to a relaxed awareness, settling back into the simplicity of things being known moment after moment without, without an efforting, without a striving. Hmm. I think that's just the simplest way, you know, of understanding it. I think it, in a Dzogchen context, it means abandoning subject-object focus, too, that it has the implication that you're not, you're not trying to fix attention on anything strategically. It's just wide open to whatever, in fact, you, you notice. Yeah, I think that could be a, a further way of, of understanding it. But the, as you point out, the crucial distinction is between being distracted and undistracted. If you're distracted, then you're just Correct. lost in thought like anyone else. And it, one of the things almost everybody notices is that it's not very easy to remain undistracted. Hmm. I mean, the idea is very nice. <laughs> You know, the, the idea of non-meditation, that open, effortless awareness. But there's something else which is needed in order to sustain the undistracted quality. And you could call it recognition, you could call it remembering, you could call it settling back. I make the difference. Well, I make you you could call it mindfulness. Wouldn't you call mindfulness the, the gatekeeper of that? Definitely. The quality of mindfulness is to know when we're distracted and when we're not. You know, yeah. that's Tulka Orgin, the, the great Dzogchen master, called mindfulness the watchman of the mind. Another phrase that I like to use, especially when I'm, I'm teaching retreats, but it could be useful for anyone practicing in the course of you know, their daily lives, is understanding the difference between being casual and being relaxed you know, in our attention, because often those two are confused. You know, we hear the uh, suggestion to be relaxed, and then before we know it, our attention has simply become casual. And in that quality, we find our minds getting distracted again and again. So there's a there's certain impeccability that's needed. This brings up a few questions. Actually, one, one question of mine, or one thing to explore further, I have recently said in another podcast, and it's directly to, to uh, Jamie's question, that I, I felt like I didn't learn how to meditate until I sat my first 10-day retreat. And I think this comment has given some people cause for despair because my experience was I got very into meditation. I was sitting really reliably an hour a day for a full year before I went off on, on the first, I think it was the Yucca Valley retreat with mm -hmm. you. And it wasn't until maybe the fifth day of that retreat, somewhere around the midpoint where I really connected to the practice mm. in a way that I hadn't before. And I remember the epiphany, presumably reasonably accurate, that 
I had just been thinking with my legs crossed in my daily practice for the previous year. An hour a day was insufficient for me to really drop down a level, you know, within a mm -hmm. mindfulness context with continuity and sustained attention to see what I wasn't seeing and to really clearly see the difference between being lost in thought and, and not. And uh, now I'm sure I was a hard case, but can you comment on that? Is that a common experience to feel like it's not until you sit in intensive retreat that you really know what it is you're supposed to be doing? I think you probably did have a strong propensity for thinking, <laughs> so it depends, you know, on what I, people. I, lo I lobbed that one to you, Joseph. <laughs> what people bring to the practice. Uh, I guess a question I would ask you, and I don't know whether you remember back to then, but in that time before your first ten day retreat, you mentioned that you were sitting pretty reliable an hour a day. Uh, the question would be, what were you doing the other twenty? three hours, you know, whether you had enough understanding of what was needed to actually be committed to the practice of mindfulness, you know, just in the course of your daily activities. And uh, many people don't appreciate the importance or the power of that. I think the jury is still out because I think there are not that many people who give that level of attention you know, and of mindfulness to walking down the street right. or to eating or to really making the daily activities part of the practice. So whether the level of concentration, you know, and settledness you experience on the retreat would come in the course of daily practice, if you did that, uh, would be an interesting experiment. Now, clearly, if people come to a retreat, they're practicing intensively all day long in silence, just sitting and walking. So there is a momentum that more easily builds up. Right. You know, so it's understandable that you had that experience. Actually, a related experience was to discover sometime later that the walking meditation practice is every bit as deep as the sitting practice. I would imagine people also make that discovery rather often later for whatever reason. And I don't know if that was in the same retreat or my next one, but at a certain point, I just it just became very clear that the walking that I had been treating as kind of a break yes. from the sitting as a way of just rejuvenating the body was uh, truly profound. And so that that's something, there are kind of layers of discovery, very simple ones at the beginning where you, you notice that mindfulness is as available in every context as every other context in principle. It's just not, it doesn't actually have to be framed by a sitting practice, though Again, the, the, the crucial difference between distraction and non-distraction is the thing that always one has to notice. Yeah, I think, I think that that is a very important insight. And many people, it does take time for them to realize how profound the walking practice can be. But anybody who's listening to this podcast might take this understanding and in the course of their daily practice, actually give more attention to the walking. And so one one a very helpful thing uh, that I s often suggest to people is if you're doing a daily practice of an hour or however long it may be, to perhaps do the first 10 minutes of walking meditation and then sit. And that does two things. One, it settles the mind so that we drop into the sitting in a deeper place from having done the walking, and it begins to reveal the fact that the awareness can be as refined in the walking as in the sitting. Hmm. Once we have that understanding, then in walking any place, we're walking down the street, we're walking from one room to another. Once we really have the sense of what it means to feel the sensations of the movement in walking, we realize it takes very little effort because we're walking anyway. There's, no, right. <laughs> there's nothing special to do except to be feeling it. Mm. Then every step we take through the day can be a walking meditation, and that gives, uh, that gives a chance for us to build the momentum that person who, who sent in the question was asking about. There's more chance you know, of building up that level of stability even outside of a retreat. Right. Although, you know, always a, tr a retreat is helpful. There's no, there's no doubt about that. But at a certain point, don't you feel that it's divorced from 
the principle of momentum? You seem to be suggesting that it's by dint of momentum that the experienced meditator has better daily meditation practice than the unexperienced one. Okay, so I, I think here, here this may harken hawk, back to our previous conversation. I don't. It's not that I have a bone to pick with you. I just uh, <laughs> no, no, keep falling no, back never. into these <laughs> same ruts. I think, given your predilection for the Zochen perspective, which you know, as you know, I have tremendous appreciation for. Also, I think it would be more useful in this conversation if you simply uh, replace the word momentum with stability, because for me, they're the same thing. Right. But I, so I, I guess I'm trying to dig under that. It's not mm. so much, because I, I see momentum, stability, they both get decisively interrupted, and they can be interrupted for so long that any notion of a carryover from some previous period in the day seems a little far-fetched, right? So you could have an hour that's just wall-to-wall -wall distraction, right? You're watching a movie, or you're arguing with someone on the telephone, or you're shopping. I mean, so something where you've linked up as many moments of dualistic confusion and distraction as you're capable of. I would imagine that hour has cleared out the bank of potential energy you have stored up from all your previous moments of continuity or momentum uh, or stability, so that you're really starting fresh. Get me to a moment where you're starting, you've, you've, you've had a, a period of total distraction, and now you just have to start fresh, and you're starting fresh with a period of, of sitting for the first time in 24 hours or even longer than that. I think that someone who knows what they're doing, knows what to look for, knows how to pay attention, has, has become sensitized to the difference between being lost in thought and being clearly aware, uh, that person can very quickly move through to an experience of clarity and sustained mindfulness that it's like, it's like a, it is like a skill that you've learned, which you, you know, you know once you know how to play the piano, once yes. you know how to ride a bike, you can actually start doing it. It's not like every time you get on the bike, you fall off because it, you don't have enough momentum yes. from your previous yes. writings. No, I, I think that's right. Yeah. So I guess it's a skill-based conception of what it means to be mindful rather than a, a storehouse of energy notion. Where they, cause I'm, not, I'm not denying that the momentum phenomenon is there. I mean, the, the there is something- The stability phenomenon. Yeah, or the stability. <laughs> but there is a, a sense of storing up energy when you link enough moments together. And that's something you get, I think, especially on retreat, where you know the day at a certain point is really humming along, and it's not something one tends to feel unless one is practicing in a sustained way. Right. But I, th I agree, I mean, with, with what you just said. Uh, I think there is another dimension in addition to having learned the skill and you know, being able to access what that skill can bring more easily. Mm. You know, the, the more practiced one is in the skill. Uh, as you say, you don't have to struggle to know how to balance on a bike each time. Right. Like the mind drops, drops right into it. Something I've noticed, you know, over many years of practice now, over 50 years, that there is a gradual buildup of what I would call the base of concentration. Mm or the base of stability, and I kind of liken it to the, the ski reports, where they give the, the snow, right, the snow right. report, and how, how deep the base is. And what I've noticed is that, of course, it will go up and down. It'll be deeper or shallower at different times. But the slope of that curve, you know, over time, uh, I have noticed has really gone up. And so mm. the mind drops more easily into a deeper base of stability of concentration and i think that's that's not a question of you know we're more or less concentrated for any particular sitting i don't know you you could probably address this more uh, accurately but uh, you know the neural pathways in the mind mm. get get i don't know the the, <laughs> the right terminology get uh, more deeply patterned yeah you know, over time, and it's just easy, even if one has been distracted. For example, you go to the movies and you're totally lost in the movie. You come out and you decide to sit for an hour. If one is well-practiced, the mind will drop into 
you know, that deeper place of stability. And that has grown over the years. You know, the more we practice, the more stable that becomes. Well, I think that fits with the skill-based model. It is a skill of attentional regulation, which you get better yes, and better yes, at. Yes. And so you just have a facility yes, for coming yes, back to the yes, present moment yes. more decisively and more, and you're, you notice when you're gone earlier. I also find that intense experience is a kind of mindfulness alarm n now and increasingly in a way that it isn't in the beginning of one's practice. So that when you're suffering, you can't s suffer for very long without realizing yes. that there's a, this is a problem for which you have a solution. Yes. You know, and th at that point, you're either kind of willfully not using the mm -hmm. solution you know, and, and indulging in some negative mind state, or you're, you're cutting through the suffering and undermining it just, just as a matter of habit yeah, you know, and, every moment going forward. Yeah, and I think one element of that habit, which for me has been a, a huge source of energy in the practice, to cut through, you know, in those moments of being caught up or, you know, lost in some kind of suffering, is the quality of interest. Hmm. For me, interest has played such a key role in my meditation practice, because when my mind is suffering, in whatever way, you know, just caught up, caught up in some reactivity, for the most part, I get really interested in what's going on in my mind. Now, how is my mind getting caught? How am, I, how am I feeding this? And that interest then provokes the attention, right. know, provokes the investigation. And interest is, uh, I love that word and I love the quality because interest is very non-judgmental. There's a, there's a tendency in the mind, I would say especially for people in the beginning of their practice, although this could go on for many years, is when we're involved in some kind of negativity or some kind of suffering, there can be a tendency to be self-judgmental or judgmental about what's arising. And that, of course, just ties the knot even tighter. Mm. If there's a quality of interest, it's like we're removing that judgmental aspect and it almost becomes, you know, the mind becomes like, it's this puzzle that we're trying to understand, that we're trying to untie the knots. And it gets very interesting. There are two expectations that cover what we've just been talking about that I think can be unhelpful. One would be the expectation that you need to be on retreat, having linked many, many moments of mindfulness together to get down to bedrock in this moment, right? So if you've been, if you've been lost for long enough, there's really nothing good that's gonna come of the next moment of mindfulness kind of a radical gradualism expectation, which I think is, is false, but also to some degree self-perpetuating. So to drop that is helpful because you really can have as deep and as meaningful an experience of mindfulness in this moment as at any point in a retreat if you really pay attention. The other is relevant to what you just brought up, the expectation that certain negative mind states shouldn't or won't come up any longer for you if you have any kind of mature meditation practice. So to feel, as you said, to feel that you really shouldn't be experiencing something and have a self-judgment added to the negative experience blocks the door to just becoming interested and cutting through it on the basis of just merely paying attention to the arising of this anger or fear or greed or whatever it is. Once you know to expect that you're going to that many negative things will keep coming up victory is in at least in my view or at, you know my stage of practice victory is in the half life of these things like how long do you how long are you an asshole for mm. right and the difference between being angry for an hour and for 5 seconds I mean that is it's that, a huge difference. That is huge. It's, it's it's just you know one an an, an <laughs> hour of sustained anger, given all that you're liable to say and do in that space, is a life a truly life disorienting state of mind. Whereas five seconds is just again you could just be the one who's interested to see this anger arise and pass away. Right. Well, there are there are a couple of things. One is uh, I'd just like to emphasize the fact that it's not necessarily that will go from an hour of anger to five seconds 
We could get five more seconds, five Quickly. seconds after that. Yes. <laughs> no, it, it, it's, it's the punctuation yes, of it that is yes. to, be, to become sensitive. Yeah. yeah. But keep the, it right. The, the, there's, there's one attitude of mind, an attitude shift, which was tremendously important for me uh, in seeing the negative you know, feelings or emotions or things that cause suffering arising in my mind. When I went from either feeling bad about myself for having them or judging them, you know, being in a adverse relationship to them, when things shifted and I became delighted to see them because I would rather see them than not see them. Mm. And there was, so there's a certain moment of delight that can happen you know, when we have that frame, so anger arises or judgment arises or fear arises or conceit or pride or envy or jealousy, you know, any, any one of the afflictive emotions. When these arise now and in the moment of seeing them, it's almost like a smile comes mm. to my mind because, you know, in the, in the language of the Buddhist discourses where the Buddha would often say, oh, Mara, I see you. That's the quality in the mind in that moment. Oh, Mara, I see you. And there's, there's a certain joy in the fact of the seeing. When that shift happens, it changes everything in terms of our relationship to it. Then that becomes the foundation for an investigation. For saying, okay, you know, what gave rise to it? How am I getting caught? How can I be free in this moment? Well, I must say, I love to see you get angry too, Joseph. <laughs> That's always fun. Well, keep trying. <laughs> so there's a few questions related here. I think we've covered some of this, but Julio Gutierrez asks, could you speak more about the path outside of the meditation cushion, how to be mindful in daily interaction with people, how to be mindful while having an intellectual discussion? We've covered some of that, but what is your thought on um, how to be mindful, if at all, while engaged in intellectual work? There's the difference between mm. thinking and not thinking or, or being lost in thought, seeing thought as thought or just the being busy thinking. This is a question I get from people a fair amount, the, the idea that you can't really be mindful while doing most of what creative, intelligent, productive people need to do. What, how do you view that? I think there are two, two domains to understand this. In one, it's something my first teacher, Manindraji, uh, would say often in addressing that question, because when we are engaged intellectually, even even something as simple as reading a book, you know, or doing any kind of creative work that involves the intellect and involves thinking, you know, or concepts, we can't really apply the same kind of mindfulness as we would, for example, in you know meditation, because otherwise the words would become disconnected. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be tuning into the level of meaning, particularly. And so Manindra used to talk about what he called a general mindfulness, where we're totally engaged in what we're doing. You know, we're engaged in the concepts and we're using that level of the mind. But there's enough mindfulness present to pick up if some unwholesome states arise in the process of being engaged in that work. You know, we're talking or we're reading or we're doing, we're doing some kind of conceptual work. And if the mind is in an even place in doing it or, or a wholesome place, you know, there's interest and creativity and energy. But then if something unwholesome should arise, there's enough mindfulness to pick, that will pick that up. Mm. And in that moment, we could kind of settle back and say, okay, what just happened? So that's a kind of mindfulness is a protection for the mind. There is one exception which I've found to mindfulness within kind of that conceptual intellectual realm. And the Buddha had an interesting comment about this, and that is in giving or in speaking the, in giving Dharma talks, or even in speaking the Dharma in a, in a Dharma conversation, that actually falls more into the meditative level than the level of just conceptual, conceptual work. So even though we're using concepts 
to express uh, the content. Mm. There's a certain power in terms of speaking the Dharma. So that it's actually possible, and the Buddha mentioned this, to get enlightened, both right. in speaking or in listening. Right. Because in that kind of conversation, if, if we're doing it with wisdom, we're not so much lost in our usual evaluation of what's being said. Oh, I like this. I don't like it. I agree with it. I don't agree with it. But rather in a Dharma conversation or either speaking or listening, it's more that we're actually doing the hmm. words yeah. rather than analyzing them. And so this is, that's, that's why it's such a powerful, it can be such a powerful experience to hear a Dharma talk or to, to be in a really engaged Dharma conversation. As I say, where we're, where we're actually experiencing what the words are saying. It seems to me that the difference may be even more categorical than that, because I, I, I just think listening to someone speak or having a conversation is potentially more amenable to that kind of expansive yes. clarity than doing other things like reading, for instance. Yes. So like if I'm talking to you, I can very clearly be mindful both while talking and while listening, mm -hmm. and I can cut through what I'm calling or have called the illusion of the self in the midst of that. And in some ways, it's even more clear because social circumstances are usually so self reifying and ramifying that to lose a sense of self while looking at your face is a clearer mirror to that experience than just looking at a wall or, yeah. or uh, some other or having your eyes closed. But if I go to read, these questions from listeners here, there's a kind of trimming down of my awareness to just decode yes. the sentence I'm reading that seems to some degree synonymous with delusion for me. It's like, it's, it's not that you can't read, and certainly if I was reading about uh, meditation or emptiness or any of these topics, I could bring a special kind of attention to the task of reading. But generally speaking, looking at words on a page and trying to figure out what they mean at least for me, is a, a much duller mm -hmm. frame of mind. And it's, it's analogous to like walking into a supermarket, just doing shopping and looking for different brands and trying to figure out which one you want. I mean, there's something so dull about that use mm -hmm. of attention. Uh, dull not as in boring, but dull as in just there's a kind of a bovine <laughs> lack of clarity uh, by comparison with other moments. Um, the ultimate example that no longer pertains, uh, happily the, the world is, is free of this experience now, but I, I recall what it was like to come off retreat decades ago and we'll go into a, a, like a blockbuster video store <laughs> looking for what video yes, to yes, rent. Yes. And there was something excruciating about that experience to just travel the shelves, reading with your head cocked to the side to read the, the vertical uh, spine of these cassette boxes trying to figure out what you wanted and just going through hundreds of crappy movies, many of which you've seen. And at that point, I was just very sensitive to the difference between you know, paying attention one way or the other. And that has always figured in my mind uh, even more than experiences of interpersonal conflict mm -hmm. as a kind of awareness that is just the antithesis of wisdom and clarity and, and mindfulness. I think that points to... How to say this? It it points to both the deluded and unsatisfying quality of wanting. Mm. Just that that mind state of wanting itself, right, is a kind of you know, the Buddhist it's the Buddhist terminology dukkha. Mm. It's just unsatisfying. The the amazing thing is that we are seduced generally into thinking that wanting is enjoyable and we live you know very often wanting to want like like your experience right. in the store you, you were just waiting to want something exactly yeah. you, you're wanting to want not seeing that the very quality of the wanting mind is inherently unsatisfying yeah, and it, it gets yeah. amplified in that case because it's you're you're kind of wanting on a deadline because you yes, you can't yes. get out of the store until you figure <laughs> out what you want, right? So you're just it, it's just a an exercise of focused 
wanting and dissatisfaction and the the, the, sort of the kind of hopelessness of the whole exercise becomes uh, obvious. Yeah, but this he, here this becomes a very interesting exercise, I think, for people to explore in the course of their daily lives because you know wanting comes up a lot in in a lot of different situations. It would be very interesting uh, for people to begin to really pick up or become aware of when there is wanting in the mind for whatever it may be and to get a to get a visceral sense of what it's like to want what does it feel like mm. you know to want to have that to have that quality in the mind and then if possible either to contrast that with other times of not wanting you know and just to begin to see the difference in one's experience between wanting and not wanting. And one could do that if, if we're aware of the wanting and then are mindful enough to just wait until it's gone, mm. because wanting, like everything else, is impermanent. And in that moment of transition, of going from wanting to not wanting, that's a really powerful moment, you know, because we get a very clear uh, understanding of the difference in our experience of those two mind states. And for myself, it always feels like I've been let out of the grip of something. Mm. As soon as the mind is released from wanting, she, there's a kind of relaxation into openness, into ease. But this is, this is not something that most people are paying attention to. You know, the, the kind of wanting mode is just so. It's so much part of our everyday lives. We we hardly pay attention to it, right? And yet, it has it offers. If we are mindful of it, it can offer a very profound understanding of the nature of mind, of the cause of a lot of suffering. And at this point, because I've played with this a lot, you know, and I I watch for this in my mind. Very often, they'll they'll not always. <laughs> There's still uh, quite a bit more to do in this regard, but. Uh, Quite often, often enough to be noticeable, I'll notice a wanting for something, and then I'll I'll consciously say, or consciously remind myself, I don't need to want this. You know, the wanting is a choice. Mm. The wanting is a choice I'm making. And if in those moments I really see that clearly and say, No, I don't, I don't need to want this, and the mind actually lets go, it's an amazing moment of ease. Mm. You know, and it's it's always available to us. It's just being mindful enough of what our minds are doing and the potential for making wiser choices. Yeah, yeah. It actually connects to this. Uh, the next question I have here from Matthew Laurel Trinidad. Uh, I would appreciate some comment on what Joseph and you think of the role of sila, uh, i.e. moral conduct, in the development of mindfulness and how to define or arrive upon the essential principles of sila or to avoid religious dogma and defining or arriving at the same. It's hugely important. Right. So say more about that, but I guess one question to get you started that just occurred to me is, it seems to me, uh, certainly reading the, the literature on meditation and understanding some of the mishaps in the careers of various gurus and yogis, it's possible to be an, quite an accomplished meditator and still be a total schmuck. Right, so it's still someone who be someone who is not only uh, not impeccable but reliably unethical by our standards. You have Swami Muktananda building a tunnel between his living quarters and the girls' dorm at his ashram, where he's essentially raping one presumes fourteen-year-old girls, and I mean they're just horrendous stories about specific people who, about whom there are also stories that really seem to attest to their spiritual athleticism in terms of the, their meditative attainments and the, the kinds of positive effects they've managed to have on people. So talk about that. Well, I think that I think this points to a, a critical distinction between power and wisdom, you know, and, and through meditative skill, the mind can become very powerful in many ways into all kinds of you know, what, what might even seem miraculous things, and certainly with strong energetic impact mm. on other people and 
So lots of, lots of experiences can happen when somebody has developed through whatever particular techniques, uh, the strength or power of mind. That's very different than wisdom, you know, and it is very possible for people to have developed these without wisdom. And isn't sustained mindfulness synonymous with a certain component of wisdom? I mean, are you talking about someone, you, you imagine that some of these teachers have just become concentrated in ways that may be pleasant and giving, giving them certain powers of mind or amped up their charisma as teachers so they have a certain mm -hmm. influence over their students, but they have just consistently missed the bullseye of what you're calling you know, right practice? That's one possibility. Because yeah, that seems a little far-fetched to me. I, I would imagine that if you grabbed someone like Muktananda in his best hour of meditation and could, could run that on your brain, you might find all of the components of what you're calling wisdom, and yet it still hasn't inoculated him against being a sociopath in other circumstances in his life. No, I, I, I disagree. I think that just classically speaking, the power of concentration is that it suppresses the defilements at a particular time, you mm. know, and so while you're in that concentrated state, it may be that these unskillful mind states are not arising, but as soon as you're out of the concentration, then these unwholesome states just reemerge because the concentration by itself, it's not a purifying force in and of itself, mm. right? It's, we're not necessarily seeing into the impermanent, empty nature of phenomena. People could be very concentrated, and while they're in that state, you hook them up to some brain monitoring, and their, their brains might uh, seem very the peaceful or calm or stable or whatever it shows. But that's not saying anything about what defilements have been uprooted from the mind, you know, and that's really the function of wisdom, uh, which is a very different kind of practice. It's also the function, though, of an explicit conceptual understanding about the importance of ethics in one's life, so that if, if, if you're teaching people to meditate without any kind of deep or sophisticated ethical consideration of just what, what life is for and what constitutes a good life, uh, then kind of the, the edges of the path are not discernible. Yes. You can't, there's, no, there's no metric by which you are, can then say, oh, my life has wandered off yes. into some yes. totally unskillful and suffering-producing direction. This relates to another point I've made in other contexts, that it's often pointed out that Buddhism can give rise to the same kinds of pathologies as you know, Islam, which I've frequently criticized. And, and what is often thrown at me is the phenomenon of the kamikaze pilots in World War II, that you can have Buddhist suicide bombers uh, because they were clearly influenced by Zen. Now, it wasn't just Zen. It was Shinto, and it was Japanese martial nationalism and, and other constellations of ideas. But Zen was definitely involved, and you had Zen masters who were advocating for this behavior. And uh, if you, anyone wants to read about that, there are two books, Zen at War and Zen War Stories, that detail that evidence. And yet you have the, now the modern spectacle of Tibetan Buddhists, rather than becoming suicide bombers, they're practicing self-immolation in response to the actions of China. And it, it seems to me, and I, you know, this is not, there's not really deep, scholarship at the bottom of this. I have more experience of Tibetan Buddhism, but insofar as I know Zen as well, you can read for a very long time in the Zen literature and not find any emphasis on compassion and sila ethics. To the contrary, you can find many analogies that seem to give a kind of martial ethic. The sword of wisdom, kind of a samurai ethic, comes to the fore often in, in Zen parables. So it's actually not a surprise to me that Zen, get under a certain construal, could have helped animate the kamikaze phenomenon. And it's also not a surprise to me that Vajrayana Buddhists are self-immolating as opposed to becoming suicide bombers. 
given the emphasis on compassion yeah, I, in I, that context. I, I, I think I have to uh, disagree with you. <laughs> but I should also say that it's, it also doesn't seem impossible to me that you could get a martial and aggressive form of, of Tibetan Buddhism because it is, there's a, a, certainly a martial history within Tibet and it's not a pacifistic religion. No, I, uh, so it's not, it's not that it's impossible, but it, it seems to me less likely than in Zen. First, I totally agree with you in terms of the importance of emphasizing from the very beginning of you know, a spiritual path or a meditative path, the importance of a foundation of sila, of, mm. of non-harming. You could say that gets programmed in from the very beginning and it becomes a reference point for really highlighting when our actions are becoming harmful. Just as a, the simplest example, you know, but this, this could be elaborated a lot. But just the, the basic precept about not lying, hmm. you know, that being truthful. If one has repeatedly taken the precepts with commitment, you know, okay, not killing, not stealing, not saying that which is untrue, not committing sexual misconduct, you know, just the basic, the basic lay precepts for living in the world in a non-harming way. What I found is from having taken the precepts and reflected on them, you know, so often, if there's a thought in the mind or I'm about to say something that which is untrue, having taken the precept, it, it acts like a little mindfulness bell. Mm. It says, oh, this, this is not true. And very often that's enough. That brings enough mindfulness to enable me to, no. So uh, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to refrain from doing that. So having, you know, laying the foundation of the precepts in whatever form, you know, people understand them and reflecting on them and, and really making it part of the practice, I think has a tremendous effect, you know, on the way we're living our lives. I think with lying for me, and obviously I've thought a lot about this and wrote a short book on it, it's not a matter of having taken the precepts. It's, it's a matter of having become attentive enough to the consequences of lying both in my life and the lives of others, to have a very visceral sense of that's no place worth going. The pain that accrues and, and also just the, the sense of divisiveness that it arises out of. You know, so if we're having a conversation and I feel the impulse to lie to you, it's already there's something wrong in the relationship. The suffering inherent to the whole project of misrepresenting huh. things so as to mislead you so as, and hopefully not get caught in the future the thing is so viscerally toxic to me that that's what sets off the, the mindfulness yeah, alarm. Yeah, but not... you, you, you've given a lot of thought and attention to this. So I think for many people, a first step in coming to that understanding is having learned about the precepts, having taken to them. The abstract wrongfulness of it. Yeah, and, and then that triggers a greater mindfulness of everything you're saying. But I think many people and not necessarily have that level of awareness of the consequences or how it feels right from the beginning. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I see that as just being a spectrum of depth of understanding. Okay, all of that being said, I think that in every spiritual tradition, whether the precepts have been highly emphasized or not, Given certain conditions, the unenlightened human mind is going to engage in some pretty harmful actions. So whether it's the kamikaze pilots in World War II, whether in the long history in Tibetan Buddhism, not just the self-immolation with respect to the protesting the Chinese, but just the hit, the history of Tibet, of, of the great monastic traditions fighting each other and killing each other. They had, yeah. a, they had a Middle Ages like everyone yeah. else. Yeah. And we see it in Burma now, you know, yeah. with many, both of the, the politicians, but also of many of the monastics with the Rohingya, mm. you know, and the tremendous 
violence and hatred. There's a crucial difference for me there, where obviously it's it's horrendous violence and worthy of condemning, uh, like any other violence. But it's important to see that there is no, certainly no clear, and I think probably just not any justification within the teachings of Theravada Buddhism for that behavior. These monks can't point to the suttas where the Buddha said, oh, uh, my followers, until you eradicate these Muslim beasts, there'll be no peace for you on this earth, right? Now, if there was a sutta like that, that would be more problematic. They, then they would be able to say, this is not only justified, this is a sacred obligation of ours to behave this way. Now, the problem with Zen, have you looked at the, those books, Zen at War or Zen I, War I'm Stories? Fami- I'm familiar with them. Because there, yeah. there are passages that oh. you could sort of see how the, the wrong Zen yeah, master yeah. could rally the troops yeah. with genuine Zen teaching. It's harder in Theravada Buddhism to do that. Now, that's not to say that you can't get Theravada Buddhists, as you point out, is happening in Burma, who are behaving like yes. murderous psychopaths on the basis of very ordinary tribalism. But it's not. It, it's always worse to have ordinary tribalism, xenophobia, yeah. <laughs> racism, in-group, out-group thinking, potentiated by a doctrine that people think is either handed down from the creator of the universe or revealed from the enlightened mind of the, the greatest spiritual adept anyone uh, I, ever paid attention to. I don't disagree with you, and I know this is your particular... You're in my wheelhouse now, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> my, my only point was that... But you, see, you seem to be disputing any kind of gradations of emphasis on sila that I think I was noticing in the Buddhist tradition that explains maybe why we're not seeing Tibetan Buddhist kamikazes, uh, and we it, did see Zen uh, kamikazes. It just seems like an accident of history, more than, than any difference in the teaching. Are you saying Zen emphasizes compassion as much as the other traditions of Buddhism? Because if so, I haven't seen that. I, I don't really know enough about Zen and Zen culture in Japan to know the place, you know, that compassion plays. I mean, I am familiar, you know, with the Kuan Yin being, right. being a major part of that tradition. I'm not engaging in the conversation on the level of, okay, which are the contributing forces which make things worse or better? Hmm. It probably is worse if things are contained right in the scriptures that justify immoral behavior. I'm just looking at whatever the conditions are, you know, wh- whether it's because there's something in the tradition or it's because of the defilements that are still remaining in the mind. And given, given certain situations, they're going to come up regardless hmm. of whether the tradition emphasizes, emphasizes sila or doesn't emphasize sila. We are talking about people behaving as people, and yes. they, these people are apes with various degrees of psychological unhealth. So however much they're practicing or not, you're going to get all of the yeah. aberrant behavior of unhappy apes most of the time. <laughs> yeah, and, and so I, it's, I, we, we've, we've really wandered, I think, wandered quite far from... Well, no, it's, it's, it's on point. If insofar as sila, that is ethics is important, the degree to which it's kept in view in any tradition or emphasized in any tradition or spelled out, it matters. Whether you're going to grant this is true of Zen or any other tradition within Buddhism or not, we could invent a tradition right now. We could start our own cult Mm. that didn't emphasize ethics at all, but gave all the full armamentarium of esoteric attentional practices of meditation, and, and you could teach mindfulness. But you could either never talk about ethics or, or explicitly deny anything useful there. You could say, oh, no, it doesn't matter how you behave. It just matters whether you're mindful. So well, rape I, and pillage and... No, see, but I, I think... It's not that I disagree with you. I'm, I'm totally in agreement about the... Then why do you sound so dissatisfied? The, 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 the importance of sila, and we talk about it a lot, and, and it's something of beauty hmm. in one's life. You know, so it's a tremendously powerful strength. I wouldn't, I I guess the 
kind of this the slight uh it's not a disagreement but a shift of emphasis you're you're contrasting that to a system you know as you described of where you're just being mindful without any reference to sila mm. and the deficit of that i think you're giving pride of place to mindfulness rather than to wisdom. Mindfulness is in the service of wisdom. Mindfulness is not an end in itself. The, the bigger question is, what do we learn from being mindful? Hmm. Because as you know, the language you used, you know, mindfulness as a training in attention. Okay, so that's, that's really important. But once we're paying attention, what are we learning? So the wisdom component, which ultimately leads to the uprooting of those defilements in the mind, which cause all the harmful actions you mentioned. So why do people behave badly in, in all these various ways? Because of greed in the mind, because of anger, because of fear, you know, because of hatred. As long as those are still in the mind, they are going to find expression. My understanding and, you know, limited experience, you know, in walking along the path, that different of these defilements actually get weakened and finally uprooted through wisdom. That's the key point where sila and the mindfulness wisdom spectrum come together. That does take us back to our last conversation with this this model of uprooting and the stages of insight. But whether or not that's true, most of us are in the position of having what you're calling the defilements not decisively uprooted. They're going to continue to arise, as we spoke of before. So negative mind states will continue to arise, fear and anger and desire. And I, I think there's a separate conversation to be had about just whether those mind states are in fact intrinsically mm. negative I and mean, what is someone like a buddha really without fear desire anger or are there sort of enlightened analogs of all of those states of mind uh, or an enlightened relationship to those states of mind so just just how unrecognizable is the experience of a quote enlightened master that's another question but leaving that aside given the situation that most right. of us are in which is Yes. You know, the, the greatest gonna, hits are yes. still going to be playing. Then the question is, how long do they play for and what are the consequences of yes. their playing given the, whatever quality of attention you can bring yes. in the present moment? And, well, th and they are having a, a, some kind of conceptual framework that sets the bounds yes. of reasonable behavior, yes. ethically speaking, is incredibly important. Uh, completely important. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's really worth bringing that teaching you know, to the forefront hmm. as being the, as being the framework and the foundation, not only kind of as a protection against excessively harmful actions, but it's also directly related to the ability to develop mindfulness and concentration. Because when we do unskillful actions and then we're meditating is very common experience is that these come to mind. We mm. start remembering them, often with uh, qualities of remorse, you know, of, of feeling badly about having done something that was harmful or unskillful. And if we are continually doing those actions, the mind is in a very unsettled state. And it's very difficult then for the mind to settle, become concentrated, become more mindful, you know, and, and mm. experience the deeper places of meditation. So there's a direct link between sila and the ability to, to enter into meditative states. That's always what's emphasized in the teaching, that, that if you have a disordered life where you're behaving unethically, you're not going to be able to concentrate effectively in, in any kind of meditative practice. I guess I'm somewhat agnostic as to whether or not that's always true, but I, I can see why one would think well, it would even, be true. Even if it's not always true, it's often true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I still think of Muktananda as, yeah, so. as uh, <laughs> the existence proof of uh -huh. spiritual athlete and mm -hmm. something approaching a psychopath, although I guess you could discount slightly for different cultural 
expectations. Well, there's another question here from uh, Krishan Bhattacharya. You never got around to explaining emptiness last time. You said you would, but you kept getting sidetracked. Leave it to us to talk for two and a half hours about <laughs> emptiness without ever explaining it. Uh, you want to take that? I give a talk explaining some ways of experiencing emptiness, you know, in our life and in our practice. So this will just be a, a brief uh, summary of that. So I think the most ordinary experience of emptiness, which we've all felt at different times, could be understood as uh, a lack of self-centeredness. You know, and usually we think of self-centeredness as being a kind of personality problem. If somebody's self-centered, you know, it's, our friends might suggest going to a therapist to become a little less so. But it actually has, you know, a more profound meaning. To be less self-centered or to have an absence of self-centeredness means that instead of having the notion or idea of self, as being the central point around which our lives revolve, mm. as they almost always do for most people. You know, we're caught up in our wants and our desires and our fears and our hopes and our anticipations, all revolving around a sense of self. As we practice, we move into what I call the Dharma realm of experience, which revolves around what I sometimes refer to as the zero center of emptiness. So instead of things revolving around a sense of self, as we become less self-centered in that way, we begin to see that our lives is the unfolding of the Dharma, then the zero center of emptiness becomes uh, the reference point, you know, for our lives. So how, how would you distinguish or not the concepts of selflessness and emptiness? In this particular framework, they're synonymous. And I, I once asked Saida Upandita, one of my Burmese teachers, mm. in Pali, these, you know, as you know, the, the, the word for selflessness is anatta and emptiness is shunyata. Mm. And I asked him what, what the difference was. And he said, don't, don't trouble your pretty no, little head about it. <laughs> no, he actually said, at least from his. Uh, understanding that they were the same, so which surprised me in a way. So there's one way of understanding emptiness to mean that. So another way we experience emptiness, again, and this is kind of in a mundane way, but we get a flavor of it, is when, you know, sometimes we just find ourselves in a state of flow where things are happening really without any effort. Uh, it's, and sometimes it could, it might be in music or sports or some creativity or, you know, we're, when we're in the zone and things are just happening and there doesn't seem to be a sense of self involved and generally things are happening uh, much better for it, you know, because the self, the I uh, is out of the way. And so that's just another flavor. We, we, we can get a flavor of emptiness, lack of self-centeredness in that regard. Another way we can experience it sometimes is when we're with great teachers who really seem to be very selfless, empty of self. You know, I've seen this with various of my teachers. It's one particular situation comes to mind when our teacher Deepama, you know, this wonderful woman, amazing, amazing yogi and, you know, it reached high levels of realization and full of metta and compassion and very empty. One time she was in the meditation hall in Barry at our center. And I just happened to notice when she came in and she bowed to the Buddha. And it was so striking to me because she was so, she so embodied the teachings. It was like Emptiness bowing to emptiness, or love bowing to love. It felt like there was no one there. Mm. So sometimes we, we can intuit just from some very great beings.
there's another whole level of understanding emptiness, and this comes from some of the other traditions. It's not so much emphasizing the selfless nature, emptiness of self in the way that I've been describing, but the empty nature of the mind itself. And so, for example, in many Tibetan or Zen teachings, in one way or another, the instruction will be look for the mind. Can you find the mind? And in that instruction, when you're actually looking for the mind in that way, there can be the experience of nothing to find. And as Tulko Urgen would often say, the not finding is the finding. That's what's to be found, that there is nothing to find. And so that can be a direct experience of the empty nature of the mind. There's nothing to find. And yet knowing awareness is still there. Hmm. There's, a, there's a very famous Zen dialogue, which I've actually used a lot in my practice. It was when Bodhidharma was, you know, had brought uh, the teachings to China. But before he started teaching, he was just sitting in this cave, as it said, for nine years. Hmm. Uh, and then this, this one uh, follower comes to him, please teach me. You know, and he had to prove, the disciple had to prove his metal. <laughs> but finally, Bodhidharma comes out of his cave and the disciple says, you know, I'm suffering so much, please, please pacify my mind. And Bodhidharma says to him, show me your mind and I'll pacify it. And the disciple says, I've looked for it everywhere and I can't find it. And then Bodhidharma says, there, it's already pacified. Hmm. And it's very interesting when I, well, I'll often tell this story, you know, in, on retreats, and very often people hear it, and then when they hear the punchline, there, it's already pacified, people will laugh, hmm. because it's kind of a Zen witticism. You know, oh, I've looked for the mind, I can't find it. There, it's already pacified. Missing the fact that there's a profound teaching there. Yeah. Those yeah. are your future kamikaze pilots. <laughs> Train those boys. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll often use that very, that very dialogue. You know, I may be just engaged in my life, walk, taking a walk or something and ruminating about some difficulty or whatever. And if I see that my mind is caught up in some kind of suffering, hmm. and because I'm very familiar with that little dialogue, all I need to say to myself is, Oh, already pacified. It's the reminder that the mind is empty in this way. There's nothing to find. Mm. And it's amazing. Just in that remembrance, that recollection in that moment, the mind is already pacified. Yeah, yeah. So all of these, th this is like a whole a smorgasbord. Although that last one, at least to my ear or in my experience, seems to also focus on anatta or selflessness. Because if you're, when you're looking for the mind, you're yes. looking for the thinker, yes. and you're not finding a thinker. You're finding the next thought arising or not. Uh, where does it go? There's no, nothing to see. And the lack of structure in yes. consciousness yes. around this phenomenon we're calling mind yes. is what jumps to the fore. And the self seems to imply a structure. Yes. I guess what this questioner may be also wondering about is the larger teachings on emptiness within Buddhism, and certainly in a tradition like Madhyamaka, where you they're talking not just about the quality of our minds, but about just the nature of reality. Yes, that yes. Is ba either based on the interdependence of everything, where any concept you'd apply to a specific thing under analysis begins to erode, and you can't find that thing. There's, there's a famous dialogue in the Pali Canon around, um, I guess, the, the questions of, of King Melinda, where he's asking, you know, where the chariot is, and I forget who it is. It's not the Buddha. It's somebody. Nagasena. Uh, Nagasena, yeah says, you know, is it in the wheels? Is it in the stirrup? Is it in the, uh, pointing to the various parts of the chariot? Although a stirrup undoubtedly right, is not right, part of a chariot. <laughs> but uh, is it in any of one of these pieces? Right. And clearly it's not. If you take all the pieces apart, that there's no chariot to be found. And chariotness isn't in any one yes, of the pieces. Yes, and so right. it's the concept of chariot is applied to a constellation of chariot parts, yes, yes. no one of which is a chariot. And so that this 
interdependent arising of any phenomenon, obviously this consideration can be pointed inward. So you you look at anger, say, where mm. is anger? Is anger that feeling of energy in your face? Is mm. it the feeling in your chest? Is it the thought of the person you're angry at arising and passing away? No one of these things is anger, and yet anger is this name we give to a, a constellation of mental phenomenon. I just, I, I think there's, there's uh, a point here which, which might be worth illuminating, which is about the union of appearance and emptiness. Hmm. And so the, the example that's often used and, and I like a lot is, and it's, it's related to your example of the chariot, is that of a rainbow. After rain, the sun comes out and we see a rainbow and it's really beautiful and you know, there's often a nice, delighted feeling in us. But when we look more carefully, we see, is there anything which is a rainbow? Hmm. And when we analyze it you know, in a careful way, we see there's no rainbow apart from, just as you mentioned with the chariot, there's, there's water and air and light and the conditions come together in a certain way. And so there's an appearance of a rainbow. So what's interesting is not to deny the level of appearance, right? The appearance is there and we experience it. And yet the rainbow is just a designation for an appearance. It's not a designation for something that is there in itself. Mm. And so that's another understanding of emptiness. Just in this regard, there was one little exchange with a Tibetan teacher when somebody asked him, you know, is the self real? And his response was, yes, it's real, but it's not really real. Mm. You exaggerate it. And I love that because on one level, the self is an appearance. There's an appearance of a self, you know, of, of Sam and Joseph and everybody else. But when we look more carefully, it is just an appearance of conditions coming together. And so that's... In that case, that's a different self than the self I'm recommending and you're recommending that someone lose in the insight of anatta. I would say that's referring to the person. The, the, I mean, a person is like a chariot. Mm -hmm. you, you, yeah. you point to person or parts. <laughs> yeah, or a human mind. The mind clearly exists. People clearly exist. And yet they're designated upon processes and parts that are, once you separate them, then there, there is in some yes, yes. paradoxical sense yes. nothing to find. Yes. But the self that is an illusion that can be cut through, that's an illusion in a different sense. That is something that you can not find. And still, all of the phenomenology of having a mind and being a person and being in a world with chariots and rainbows, all of that is still present. And yet, but the implied center in consciousness can drop away. So that's, that's one point, that there's gradations to this illusion. Another thing I'd put in this category is free will. Free will is a misconceived notion mm -hmm. yes. about the way the yes. world works. Yes. It's, not that, it's not like a chariot or a rainbow. It's actually not there, Yes. right? The self is like that. The self that is the atta that, that anatta cancels mm -hmm. is like that. That doesn't cancel the human mind. It doesn't cancel the phenomenon of thoughts and emotions and bodily sensations. Oh, so that's the difference I'm pointing to. I haven't quite understood what that comment was in reference to, because I, well, this, I, the, I totally agree with that. It's the way we moved from the analogies of the chariot and the rainbow to the self, which well, I thought I think, was potentially misleading. Yeah, it could, it could be misleading. It applies to the person. It applies to the human mind. It doesn't apply, at least in my view, to the sense of there being a thinker yes, of the thought. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Right. But I, I think it, it's just a way of acknowledging the conventional designation, you know, that here we are, there's Sam sitting over there and I'm sitting right. over here and we're talking to one another. So in the conventional level That of, sort of self yeah, exists. Yeah. The, and the so self it's just as, as the person exists. Yeah, so it's just acknowledging that, but the Buddha went much deeper to see that when you look carefully, it doesn't refer to anything in and of itself. It's just a collection of, of right. elements. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, the, what's different about the self, though, is that we seem to experience the self-essence as 
be a center to consciousness and a thinker of thoughts. Yes, yes. In a way that we don't impute a chariot or rainbow essence when we look closely at them. Mm -hmm. There's another connection to emptiness, though, that just occurs to me, which is the experience of selflessness does, when it's experienced clearly, does change one's experience of the outer world. So that there is a an experience of what I would call emptiness when looking at the world that is the, the consequence of this centerlessness, which is the concepts one applies to the world are held much more loosely. The, the, Until they're not. First there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then no, there is... No, no. Well, there's that. There's that. You're giving me a Donovan song? Right? <laughs> there's that, but it's also, uh, just in the way you were saying it, it suggested that... I'm a reifying emptiness? Or well, the, to, or, or that... The false it, god it's of a, it, It's a... It becomes a steady state of that realization, right? Whereas one can have a one can have a realization, a, a transforming one, you know, of selflessness, and still many times still get caught up in identification with one thing or another. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thought you were making the deeper uh, <laughs> Zen point of that no too, longer holding that too. to <laughs> that, emptiness. Yes. That too. And just, just an interesting point here is, uh, and it was made both by Nagarjuna and one of our, you know, Dzogchen masters, uh, Nyoshal Ken Rinpoche, mm. uh, in talking about different kinds of attachment, where it said that it, attachment to things being solid and real, you know, in, in some substantial way, is very problematic but even worse and more difficult to uproot is attachment to emptiness because people can get some notion of emptiness and be continually up-leveling every conversation, even one's dharma practice. Oh, everything is empty, nothing matters. Yeah, you know? yeah. And they, both Nagarjuna and Nyoshal Ken Rinpoche were saying, for people who are caught in that attachment, it's extremely difficult to come out of it because there's no, there's no place to take a stand. But it's a conceptual place. Yeah. It's, it's not a place of actual realization. Well, that's what I think we touched on in the last podcast around some of the liabilities that mm -hmm. we both saw in, in Punjaji's mm -hmm. scene, which is, I guess, for which Vedanta as a tradition mm -hmm. is, is also somewhat culpable. This emphasis on the all or nothing quality mm -hmm. of the realization, and there is nothing to practice apart right. from just getting it, capital I, yes. capital T. And if you've gotten it, there's no reason to practice. And if you feel there's a reason to practice, you haven't gotten it. Having the path articulated that steeply yes. leaves a lot of people pretending to have gotten it or yes. having some experience and no conceptual understanding that they can then practice that experience. Yes. Yes. And so they're just left thinking about yeah. it and asserting it conceptually. Yeah. And becoming uh, incredibly <laughs> annoying. There's, there's a related question here I'm seeing on Twitter, which is from uh, Joseph K., one of Kafka's characters. Is ego loss one state, or are there varying kinds and degrees of ego loss, if the latter elaborate on the different types? Mm -hmm. Is there only one insight into the illusoriness of the self? I think this can be answered in several different ways. Two come to mind just at the moment. So in the classical Theravada model of defilements being uprooted, at the first stage of stream entry, first stage of awakening, one of the defilements that's uprooted is wrong view. Mm. So there is a deep enough and transformative enough realization of emptiness that the view of self, the view that there is some self-center to this whole process, that's uprooted. And so one's whole view of, you know, this mind-body and the world really is transformed. What's interesting, though, is that there is another defilement of mind which is not uprooted until the last stage of awakening, until one is in our hunt, which is called the defilement of conceit. In Pali, it's called mana. And conceit means that sense of I am. And we can experience this I am in two different ways. We can experience it over time. That mm -hmm. is when we have the sense of I was in whatever way we were in the past, 
I am this way now, I will be in the future. So it's, it's a more global self-concept, a narrative self or an, uh, the autobiographical self. Yeah. And, and so that's one way it can be experienced. It can also be the, the, this conceit of I am can also be experienced in terms of when we're comparing ourselves with others in one way or another, mm. which we do a lot. That's, that's a very common pattern. We see ourselves as better or worse or in whatever way we're evaluating more beautiful, less beautiful, smarter, not smarter. So that's another manifestation of I am. What's interesting is that this pattern is very deeply conditioned. It's still there even after the wrong view of self has been uprooted. Mm. We've had a, a realization that the view of self is incorrect and, and it really has been uprooted, but the habit pattern of the conceit is so deeply conditioned that the habit pattern continues. The difference is that even as we're caught in that habit pattern, the understanding is that the conceit itself is selfless. So we don't have the view that that pattern is self, even though the very pattern is constellating some sense of I am in that moment. So that's part of the gradation of right. the understanding. There's one other way of understanding the gradation, which I find really useful because it, it's exceedingly pragmatic. You know, we can talk about emptiness, we can talk about selflessness, and some people may resonate with it. Some people, it just feels too abstract. And, you know, what's really being talked about here? In one way, the most pragmatic experience of self and selflessness really has to do with whether in any moment of experience there is an identification with that experience as being I or mine. So a thought comes, if we're identified with a thought, I'm thinking, or this is my thought, in that moment the notion of self is being created. It's not that the self is something that's there and has to be uprooted. Hmm. It's simply a question of, do we stop creating it moment after moment through not identifying with what's arising? And I find this just really useful because then it becomes interesting to watch, okay, what are the, what are the things we most commonly identify with? What are the kind of thoughts? You know, many thoughts come and go. We're not identified with them. They're just like sounds passing through. But then certain thoughts we will be identified with or certain emotions, you know, or certain situations in the body. So, not being identified with thought, at least in my lexicon, is synonymous with recognizing thoughts as thoughts. Now, that's, yes. a, that's, a, yes. that's already a high level of, of mindfulness yeah. practice yeah. For, for someone to be able to do that with any kind of regularity. So were you saying that, or were you talking about thoughts that pass through an ordinary person's mind without much consequence, and yet they're still not recognizing? Right. No, no, I'm talking about the first. Okay. And I would say it's true that it takes some degree of mindfulness, but to go back to your earlier point, I don't think it's a question, I'll use the M word, I don't think it's a question of momentum. Hmm. I think, and here's going back to our earlier conversation, I think it's more a question of interest. Hmm. If people are interested in watching their minds and understanding their minds, this is a capacity that we all have. It doesn't take any great meditative depth or skill. We just have to be interested in noticing thoughts, you know, as they come. And many, we, we, you know, we, we won't be mindful of, we'll, we'll be caught up in. But the more interested we are, we can, we can see them and notice the difference between being lost and identified with them and not. Hmm. So I think there's great potential here for getting glimpses of selflessness in the midst of our ordinary lives. Hmm. Uh, I've seen many questions about Goenka's style of body scanning versus the Mahasi style of noting or just any other form of mindfulness. I think some of this could be inspired by the last podcast where you described your very unpleasant experience of striving in a goal-oriented way in the context of practicing under Goenka. 
So many people are wondering whether you feel that there's a better, or worse version of mindfulness practice that you may want to. Not at all. I, I think that there are. Munindraji, my first teacher, he, he had a very open, curious mind. So he, he was very non, non dogmatic, non sectarian. After he practiced, did most of his practice with Mahasi Sayadaw in Burma. And then he went and he said he studied over 50 different ways of doing Vipassana mm. in Burma. And he just had this tremendous interest. In, and I really appreciate kind of what I learned from him in terms of, be, you know, this non-sectarian attitude. And having practiced in a few of those different modes of Vipassana, I definitely do not see one as being better or worse than another. They're all skillful means at different times for different people. One or another may be more or less effective. And I've been as striving in the Mahasi method as in doing Goankas mm -hmm. method. I've been as striving doing Dzogchen. <laughs> as doing, oh. And striving has nothing to do with the practice. Then you it's were not, really doing it wrong, Joseph. Uh, I was doing it wrong in all of but them. Really, to strive <laughs> in Dzogchen, that is well. just... <laughs> Of all the things to strive in. Well, exactly. Well, that's this, like injuring yourself <laughs> eating frozen yogurt. <laughs> the same is true in Vipassana. If one is striving in that unskillful sense, it is not doing it correctly. But that is a pattern that is in us. You know, there's, there's that wanting in the mind, and we have to learn to see it in order to let go of it. If you were striving in Dzogchen, I'm going to... You, can, uh, you can't let go of this. I'm going to say that was the consequence of all your Vipassana training. You were trying I to don't think so. You were trying to figure out how to Vipassanize it. No. I, I, think it's, I think it's a liability of... And not a liability. I think it, it, in a way it's part of the path for everybody. That, you know, when the Buddha was talking about uh, the example of, of right effort, and of mm. really understanding what that means. He used the example of tuning the strings of a lute, too tight, too loose. It's only by watching the mind, you know, in these various ways, that we see, that we, that we come to the balance of non-striving. Mm. Well, in, in defense of your striving in Dzogchen, there are all the other things that, all the other practices you get handed in Dzogchen beyond this insight into emptiness or non-duality. There's the, all of the visual stuff that gets emphasized later on. And even aside from that, even in, in the Dzogchen practice itself, Sovni Rinpoche had, had a beautiful little piece, which I, I can't remember it in detail now. He was basically talking about the various levels of kind of attachment or striving in doing Dzogchen practice, you know, as one is learning it. Mm. This is not after mastering it, but in the learning of it, the very natural tendency of the mind, you know, maybe to get a glimpse of the empty nature of mind and then wanting to sustain it. To prolong it, it yeah, yeah. So uh, there are so many subtleties. A good analogy that he uses for that very error is it's like ringing a bell and then trying to prolong the natural continuity of the right, ring. Yeah. So like it, it, you ring the bell, you ring it once, and then it lasts as long yeah. as it lasts. Yeah, yeah. You don't keep bashing the bell yeah, trying yeah. to. Yeah. So, and it's just there are many, you know, each tradition has its own, its own particular <laughs> forms of, you could say, of doing it wrong. <laughs> but that's all part of the learning. That's, if we could do it perfectly from the beginning, we'd all be enlightened masters. I guess I just, I just want to, I'm not sure this, what this is in reference to, but mm -hmm. it's just coming to mind in the moment. And in a way, for me, it, it ties together uh, the Vipassana and the Dzogchen and kind of all, all the traditions. And for me, the practice has become so simple and integrated at this point. And it really revolves around the Four Noble Truths but in a very pragmatic way, not in a not in a theoretical way. And so, when the Buddha talked about nibbana or the the free mind as being the end of craving, hmm. uh, and so he says this in many places. It's very explicit. There's the truth of dukkha, the truth of suffering, and the the cause of that is we talked about a little bit before. Kind of the wanting mind is itself is itself a state of suffering. 
And the end of dukkha is the end of craving. And for a long time, I would think of that as being the far off goal. You know, okay, if I practice, you know, for 20 years or 20 lifetimes, maybe, hmm. maybe at some point I'd reach the end of craving. But in one, at one point on retreat, I had a kind of realization that, that we can actually practice the end of craving moment to moment. And then it becomes very interesting to watch in all the ways we discuss the kind of the, the wrong ways of doing practice, hmm. you know, whatever the practice is, whether Vipassana or Dzogchen or different techniques of Vipassana, that basically the wrong ways of doing them involves some kind of craving or other. Mm -hmm. It's wanting something. And that the release from craving in the moment, the momentary letting go of that wanting, that craving, is a settling back, you could say, into emptiness or into selflessness or into openness, you know, into the empty nature of mind. As Tuk Oregon would say, you know, if we do that short moments many times, we see the craving and the release from it and actually pay attention to what that experience is of going from craving or wanting to not wanting and recognize the nature of the mind free of craving. Right. Even if it's just for a moment or two, you know, and then we get caught again in craving and then again release. So in one way that becomes our whole practice and that's, that's the practice essentially of all the traditions. It's the end of craving. And it doesn't have to be seen in terms of simply a far off goal. It's actually the practice moment to moment. So I have a, one final question. I'll close on this. And this a, um, the spirit of the question is, I would imagine one you don't get a lot because you're in the business of teaching meditation to people who already concede that they want to learn it. But in, in my business, I, I am um, talking to people who are as you know, rather radically skeptical of you know, religion in general, as I, I think they should be, but by association of any project that has any historical entanglements with religion, in this case Buddhism. And so there's the, just the question of why do any of this? And why isn't this just no better than thinking happy thoughts or having a whatever reasonably happy life you can eke out by totally ordinary, secular, scientific, and non-introspective slash spiritual pursuits. So there's a, a fundamental doubt of why is this interesting, relevant? Why is this anything mm -hmm. other than one of the variants of confusion that we see religious imbeciles fall into century after century? What would you say to someone who doesn't see the point in any of this or anything that we've talked about thus far. And this, we're, we, we sound like people who've been talking about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin to some number of people who are listening to us if they've gotten this far. How would you start the conversation with such a person? Well, I'd start the conversation by suggesting that people explore an app that Dan Harris and I just created oh, and worked that, on. That, that's my job as host. Let me... <laughs> Tell us about the app that you and <laughs> our mutual friend Dan Harris have just created. Right. Well, as, as perhaps some of the, the listeners know, Dan Harris is an ABC news anchor, and he wrote this best-selling book, 10% Happier, after coming on a 10-day retreat and being really turned on to the potential for becoming 10% happier in one's life. But he came from the perspective of being a total skeptic. Uh, and yeah. his book is very funny and engaging, both about his professional life, but also about his meditative experience. That's why I don't yeah. want that to blow by. That's why I recommend his book to people before I recommend my book. I, I recommend that people read his book, 10% Happier, before mine waking up, because it's really the perfect introduction, for, especially for my crowd, because he was so skeptical. Yes. Yeah. And his entrance into this practice is so fraught with. The consequences of his skepticism is oh. it's hilarious and very, very useful. So. Yeah, and he, he does it with tremendous humor. Yeah. And, and so we had the idea to create a meditation app for skeptics. Right. And it basically addresses that question, you know, and it, part of it is 
dialogue that we're having together in part are just audio guided meditations, all very short, you mm. know, five to 10 minutes in length. And it really is about both learning the skills of meditation in the service of first becoming a little happier in our lives, letting go of those patterns in the mind that cause us suffering and learning how to do this. And this doesn't require any belief system and it doesn't require any special outfit, you know, or it's just becoming interested in what aspects of our minds and our, our lives are conducive to happiness and which are not, which, which just create patterns of suffering over and over again. And it's all very simple. It's very straightforward. And there's a way to do this in a totally non-sectarian, non-religious framework. One of the things that my first teacher, Manindraji, said to me when I went to India, and I, I was looking for meditation, but he said something so simple and so pragmatic. He said, if you want to understand your mind, sit down and observe it. Hmm. And that was it. <laughs> there was, it, was, it was just, there's so much common sense to it. You know, how else can we understand ourselves except by learning to pay attention? And it can be done in a very simple and straightforward way. There's this obvious point, but it's not obvious to many of us, which is your mind is all you have. I mean, show me an experience yes, yes. that you're having that isn't mediated by your mind and yeah. show me a relationship that isn't as good or as bad as it is based exactly. on the minds involved. Exactly. And so exactly. if there is some way to improve, understand it, to understand it and actually have a better experience yes. Yes. as a result of that understanding, yes. it seems worth looking into at yes. least in five minute intervals. Yes. <laughs> at some point in the future. So that, mm -hmm. I think, as an antidote to skepticism, I would say, be as skeptical as you want, but one, realize that you don't have an argument against paying closer attention to what it's like to be you, if you want to understand mm -hmm. yourself in some way. And the moment you attempt to pay attention, you'll encounter the difficulty of that project, and that could become interesting to you. Why is it so hard to pay attention to anything for more than one second at a time. And then you'll see that there's actually a, a methodology to get better at that. And again, it, as you just said, it has absolutely nothing to do, uh, though historically it has had something to do with, with believing various things about the nature of the universe that we can call religious. It does not in principle have anything to do with that. Yeah, so your app would be a great way for someone who has no experience, or or even someone who has experience, if they want to formalize yes. this effort, it'll get you to do it yes. in a way yes. that you may not manage on your own. Yeah. And yeah. in your case, having someone who, I mean, some of these meditation apps are awful because what you have is, I mean, clearly someone who's just reading a script, mm -hmm. who's not someone who knows even what the import mm -hmm. of the words that mm -hmm. they're reading, that's, that's not the case across the board, but I've seen some of those apps too. But in your case, what's great about the marriage between you and Dan is you have someone who's really in touch with the skeptical mind, mm. and then you have someone like yourself mm. who's an actual expert on mm. the practice. So that's that's great. And there's also a coach involved. There's a coaching function. Oh, that's right. That's in right. the app, which can also be a helpful support. There's a problem. I don't. It depends when we release this podcast. But when I was looking for your app in the App Store, it mm. was not easy to find. There's a problem of just discovery in in Apple's App Store. So I will put the link to the relevant mm -hmm. spot in the app store so that you guys can find right. that app. The, the app's called 10% Happier. It's 10% Happier. It's 10, right? happy. it's 10 the number, right. 10, and then the percent sign happier. So that may so be a, a it, search it, problem around. Yeah, it's not, the, it's not written out in words. Okay. Well, they, people have overcome greater obstacles to enlightenment than <laughs> getting their search terms, right? So, Well, thank you, Joseph. This, wow, this is, is another long installment uh, <laughs> and uh, hopefully useful to the right. now three people who have followed us <laughs> thus far. Once again, a pleasure yes. to talk to you on these topics. Always fun. <laughs> to be continued. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. You can leave reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. 
You can share it on social media with your friends. You can discuss it on your own blog or podcast. Or you can support it directly. And there are two ways you can do this. You can leave a donation through my website at samharris.org forward slash donate. Or you can try a membership at Audible, the world's leading source of audiobooks, at audibletrial.com forward slash Sam Harris.